Nuke is one program that we can do 3D tracking in. The nice thing is that if we do tracking inside of Nuke, we could take it into Maya, which is great. Uh, if we did our tracking in another program like Mocha, or not Mocha, uh, PF Track or Buju, we could actually take it into After Effects, Nuke, or Maya. Um, the tracker inside Nuke is kind of limited. It's not like the best tracker, but if that's the only tool we have, we need to work with it to figure out how we can do this kind of stuff. Um, so I'm going to go to my piece of footage here. Okay, The first trick in this is finding a piece of footage. All right, so on the servers, um, I've put up several folders. Let me just go through those things so you can see the footage that I have on those folders. Um, one of them is this castle. And the castle is just this piece of footage that just pans like this. And this is great for doing uh, matte paintings because this is essentially what you would get. You would get something that has a very boring background, has a cool camera move, and we just want to see more stuff inside the scene. Um, so you can see how this goes like that. Now, because this is a um, uh, a piece of footage, like this looks like it's actually like a piece of video that they shot, there's no huge green screen in the background. All right. Sometimes if you worked on um, a movie, they may green screen everything behind this castle and you build the rest of it, let's say. Um, in this case, we don't. We actually have like fog way off in the background and we have some trees back here and all that. So that's all stuff that we have to take into consideration. If I put a mountain back here, it can't be a crystal clear mountain because that wouldn't make sense. It has to match the colors and all the uh, luminance of the area back there. All right, and obviously it has to match the motion. So this is a, a nice shot for doing like a little 3D track on. Um, it also helps that it's a simple move and there's no people in the shot. The more items we add to this, the more complex it gets and the harder it becomes to track a 3D shot. Um, so that's one of them. That's called the Warwick Castle. This is, uh, I forget which one this one's called, Slow Motion Circus. I'm not sure why they call it that, but it's Slow Motion Circus. And these are all just random things that I found online um, that I thought were pretty cool. Um, oops. Come on. Oh, there you go. All right, so this one is this guy on a little slide, and he's just going back for, backwards. Now, the only part that kind of confused me was why they have these green dots on the ground, because there's no real camera movement in the shot. Like, if I watch that, it's blurry here, sure, because the guy's in focus, but then it's not. So there's no real camera move, so these X's on the ground don't mean anything, okay? So something like this, the process is actually a lot simpler because we don't have a camera move. There's no tracking needed for this one, okay? The only bit of tracking we probably have to do is right here on these. So let's pretend that we wanted to do a muzzle flare on these uh, guns. I would track the tip of each of these, okay? Because that's where the muzzle flare is gonna come from. So I wouldn't use a 3D tracker on this. What I would use is just a 2D tracker, just that same tracker we used on that first tracking assignment when we did the cars. I would just draw my box around this and I would just track the movement of that piece going backwards and then replace it with a little piece of muzzle flare each time. And then I could rotate it and scale it and whatever else. Um, he does kind of like pull them back a little bit like that. So there might be a couple spots where the tracking footage loses it or whatever, but still pretty good. Right, you could probably drop it in too. You may not even have to track it. Um, let's see, what else do we got? Uh, oops, that's that. There's the castle. Uh, this is going to be our first, like, big, big project. So, so far we've done just a bunch of, like, little things. So, over the summer, um, the Foundry had a contest for um, this piece of footage. So, this is, this is very similar to a piece of footage you would get from a client. They would say, here's a clip. I need you to do something to the clip. You can see our frames. 365 to 420. So it's not like we have like hundreds and hundreds of frames. You're literally dealing with less than 100 frames. Uh, but what happens in this frame um, is a lot more. Okay. There we go. So we can see there's not a whole lot of stuff that's actually on screen in this shot. 
But in order for us to, what the idea is, is that you're making a uh, UI and she's kind of interfacing with this UI as she's moving over there. In order for this to look correct, we need to basically make a glow or whatever on her skin so that as she's doing this, it looks like she's actually interacting with the screen, okay? So for this one, you can see that there is some camera move. We're moving slightly to the right, okay? So now for this kind of shot, we need to still kind of match the camera because as we move to the right, uh, we need to make sure that our glows and stuff are, st are staying put where they should be. And they're not just like floating around in space. Uh, it becomes more apparent when we actually get to that stage of seeing that. Okay, and then we have this shot here where here she's actually using the interface, okay? So this is kind of like the biggest key shot of it because we're basically dead on. We're gonna see the entire interface right here. She has a little keyboard there that she types on. We'll see the keyboard. Um, so all of this stuff inside of this scene is kind of like the, the money shot, so you can see it all. And this one is, what, 232 to 370, so it's about 140 frames. Okay, but all the stuff has to interact. I can't just like drop in a box or a picture and have it just look like it's there, it's not going to work. I have to add glows. I have to make sure it interacts with her skin. I have to make sure that um, it's down here. Now, while they shot this, they actually did do a little bit of planning um, in making this screen black because when it's black, we don't need to worry about keying it because we can just treat it like it is just kind of like a, a hologram sitting on top of the desk. If it was green, it would actually be a lot more difficult to remove because just like the screen, we'd have to pull the green off and then put her reflection back on and it may not turn out as um, I, uh, technological. Now there also is in this shot, if you look at the table from the start to the finish, you'll see that there is a camera move inside here. If you look at her, it's hard to see. But if you look at the table, you'll see that there is a definite camera move from here at the end to here at the start. Oops. Okay, so this is again something that would have to be tracked. Now just like we talked about in our other tracking things, I can't track her in this shot because that's going to screw me up. I have to track the environment and see how the environment moves or track pieces of the environment to see how those move. All right, and then, oops, that's one we saw already. Here's another one where we're a bit closer. Okay, very similar to the other one. Uh, I don't think that there's a camera move on this shot. Nope, this one is steady. Here's one from the side. A little bit of a camera move on it. Again, we're dealing with under 100 frames. It's about 80 frames. Well, those 80 frames, there's a lot of work in it because of how this swiping is happening. We have to make sure that it's all interactive, it's all working correctly, and we have to have a plan for this kind of thing, okay? So we're gonna talk more about this shot next week um, of how we're gonna do this, and then over break, you're gonna actually plan out what you want the interface to look like. And basically what we're gonna do is for all five of these, it's five shots, all five of these shots, we're gonna build assets. We're gonna build one screen that has all the stuff that we need on it, and we're gonna use it for every single shot, okay? So we're gonna treat it like it is an actual interface. So when she swipes, it moves the whole thing over, and then we would see the next thing. We're not gonna build a separate interface for each shot, because that wouldn't look uniform. We want this to look as uniform as possible. And then here's her fingers on the keyboard, typing away. And even for this, in order for us to make it look like her hands are actually under the key or on top of the keyboard, we have to put the keyboard under her fingers, which means we have to key out her hand in order for it to look like something is underneath it. All right. So we'll get into that uh, a bit more next week, uh, but that is another piece of footage if you want to just play around with it. So these three um, pieces of footage are inside there. All right. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to... Um, set my project and do all that stuff. So, yep, that's where I'm saving it. And then where do I want to set my pro or save my stuff to? Right there. Uh, I'm setting this to HD uh, 1080. And then I do want to also set my frame range. As we start to work with these nodes, because now we're starting to get this bigger and bigger graph, um, this input here is not going to work as good, okay? It'll actually um, default to like zero to one, and it just won't show us our stuff. 
So I'm going to double click on this piece of footage and see it's 0 to 257. So when I go down to my settings, I'm going to set this to 0 to 257. That way I'm locked in. So when I come over here to say global, it's locked. Okay, I don't have 16,000 frames. Okay, um, that's cool. All right, so I can close that. I'm going to save my work. All right, so camera tracker. So that's what we're going to play with. So there's actually just a, an item called camera tracker. Our mission with this one is that we want to get out a camera. I need a 3D camera moving around so I can actually drop in 3D elements if I need to. Okay, so I'm going to create a camera tracker. And um, the crazy thing about this specific tracker is how easy it is to use. Kind of like the planar tracker, we had to set stuff up. The 2D tracker, we had to set stuff up. This one, we don't, okay? Typically you don't, especially for this shot. It worked pretty good without having to set stuff up. Um, you may have to come into the settings tab and you may have to play with stuff, uh, but I'm gonna hit preview features just so you can see this. Remember when we did our 2D track and made the little plus signs? Okay, this throws all the plus signs in those areas that are um, high contrast. So it's basically looking for areas that are very, very contrasty and it automatically drops a little plus in there. So areas that aren't going to be tracked very nicely are the sky. I don't know why it puts them up there. There's no way that it's going to track a cloud moving, especially that faint. But it throws them up there anyway. And what it's going to do is it's going to go through, I'm going to go to the tracker here, and I'm going to say track. All right? And it's going to give me a license error, and I'm going to kick the computer, and we're going to reboot maybe. No, nope, it's still here. Track. There it goes. Um, whatever. Okay. So as it goes, what it's going to do is it's going to track each point. So as this is moving along, it's literally tracking every single one of these points, trying to figure out where each point is moving. Just like our other tracker, we could run into the issue where we have tracking points bouncing around. Um, but because it's basically thrown out, uh, I don't know if it'll let me switch it to my tab. Yeah. So it threw out 150-ish um uh, markers okay it does its best to try to throw out that many if there's not that many points it doesn't do it okay um, so if I if it throws out 150 out here what it's gonna do is it's gonna basically use them as much as they can and at the end of this it'll have a hundred and let's say a hundred a hundred tracks that actually tracked from start to finish or throughout this entire thing and it averages all these things together to create one nice camera move Okay, so um, the more tracks you have, sometimes the better, but also sometimes the worse, um, especially if we had, you know, a bunch of things changing. But the, I mean, the great thing is, like, I literally just added it and hit track, and now it's just going to track, and we can watch it and see. Um, if there was a a person walking in frame, I can't have that because I'm, I need to basically figure out what's the camera doing. So I need to eliminate that person from the shot using a roto. So I would literally just drag a roto around them, move the roto with it just to eliminate that person from being tracked. And the tracker will know you've cut that person out so it won't track that big black area in the middle of the screen. Okay. So it's trying to figure out where's this window moving from this point to that point and this point to that point. And it's just, it's amazing how it does it. Um, all the tracking softwares work in a very similar fashion. They all have these large tracking points that are on here and they're all trying to just figure out how this point and this point are moving in relationship to each other. And that's how it's gonna create this camera move. The stuff that is um, further in the back is gonna move different than the stuff that's closer to the camera. Um, another thing that's kind of important too, or sorry, not kind of, but really important, um, is um, our distortion. So let's say, while we're waiting, I'm sure you guys have seen GoPro footage before. Um, if I go to images. So one of the big things about GoPro is it creates this really, really wide camera angle, right? It's like a big fisheye lens. But what happens with it, look at the trees here. See how the trees are kind of arcing in towards itself? But what happens is as we drive closer, 
um, the trees in the center are perfectly straight and then they kind of bow out. So we actually can't have that happen because that will throw off our camera. It'll think our camera is actually like bending on itself or something. So um, before we bring any footage into Nuke, we always undistort it, okay? We always take the distortion off of it. Um, this piece of footage didn't look like it had any distortion, so we don't need to worry about that. Uh, one of the ways that we can do that is a, um, is this little distortion grid, okay? So sometimes if you're not sure about a specific camera, every camera, every lens has some amount of distortion to it, even your iPhone, even whatever. So what you can do is before you even take a video with it, you shoot a video of this, okay? Or shoot a picture with this. And what that's gonna give you is how distorted is my footage, okay? You just take it, fill the screen, you take a picture of it or a video of it, and you'll have a clip of how distorted this is. Because if I shot this with a GoPro, it would be like this big arc. So when I bring that into Nuke, Nuke will say, okay, you have this distortion, I'm going to straighten these lines out and it'll straighten those lines out. Now, just like we talked about before, whatever we bring into Nuke, we want to also send out of Nuke. So if my footage comes into Nuke and it's distorted, I undistort it, I do all my work to it, and then I redistort it, okay? And that might sound kind of weird to do that, but if we're trying to maintain that same look throughout, we need to do that, okay? Perfect. I timed that perfectly, all right. So uh, there's our footage. I'm gonna save just so Nuke doesn't crash on me. All right, so now that it's tracked, if I were to um, scrub through this, you can see all the points moving. And you can definitely see that there is a kind of pattern to how this is moving. Okay, so that's just the tracking part. So what that does is it just tracks. Okay, so now I need to get something out that I can use because right now I can't use any of that information. So I go to solve and what solve is going to do is it's going to take all this information of how all these points are moving and it's going to build a 3D camera. Okay, and that part happens pretty quick. The green spots are good tracks. The red spots are bad tracks. I bet if I rewind, um, we're going to find a lot of tracks that are in the sky probably turned red. Okay, uh, there's one red, there's a couple green. Now, if a track is on there for, oh, that one's on for 42 frames, that's odd. Um, here, see how I hovered over the track and it says track length 42? That means that that specific track point is tracked for 42 frames, which is surprising. Um, this red one tracked for 61 frames. Now, if you look, why did one track uh, longer but is a bad track? If you look here, there's an error, okay? So it's telling you, I'm pretty confident, but I think there's a 5%, there's an error here, five pixel error. Um, so uh, that's where we get into that. And that gets into the um, medium error is 5.45 and the maximum error is 14.9. So it's kind of like really unsure about that. Where if I go to a green one, you can see like this one, the error is 0.122 and the maximum is 2.5. The bigger the number, the more error, the worse it is. That's all we have to know. It doesn't matter what any of the other stuff is. We just have to know that the bigger the number, the worse it is. So this is actually a pretty decent track. Now my overall is a 1.3 error. Again, you kind of will figure this stuff out as you go, but it doesn't matter because once we play it, we'll see. If the, the points aren't moving right, then we know it's a bad track. So if I hit play, what we should see is all the points moving with the object that they're by. If we see a point kind of like by a window and it's gradually like floating up to the top of the castle and then into the sky, that's probably not a good track, okay? So we usually see that stuff maybe with like the red ones um, or the yellow ones. I'm, so far I haven't seen any that are kind of floating off uh, where they shouldn't be. Nope, everything looks good so far. Let me rewind it and play it again. Yeah, so that looks pretty good. All right, so now that I have this, <clears throat> I'm gonna hit the tab key. And this takes me into our actual like 3D world. And if I zoom in really close, I see there's a bunch of dots here. And all of these dots are basically my 3D scene. 
And if you look at it, you can kind of see the 3D scene, right? If you look at what this looks like, uh, I think further on we can kind of see it better. There we go. This is basically like this kind of shape, that castle. And when we come into 3D, that's basically what we have here. Okay. Now what would really help in this footage is if we knew exactly what kind of camera they shot the footage with because we could actually put in that information. So like we talked about before with like the soccer ball, when we're trying to recreate that soccer ball and make it look accurate, we need to punch in this information. So we don't have it, so we can just leave it at the default. And if it turns out that it's not looking good, we can come back and tweak those settings. Um, that's what's great about shooting your own footage is that you have that information. So on this Warwick one, Warwick, sometimes you'll see your footage actually has like a text file in there where it shows what the stuff is this one doesn't or you can sometimes go to the properties under the details and it'll show you all that stuff because this was shot with a video camera brought into After Effects and then rendered out as a sequence it doesn't have any of that information okay so we're just kind of like we live with it um, but let's do this I'm going to just create a sphere so all the 3d stuff is this box okay so instead of a sphere I'll just make a geometry cube sure. there it is and I'm going to scale it down. Um, the hotkeys, just to make it convenient for you, are nothing like Maya. Um, control is the rotator, control shift is scale, and neither of those is move. Okay, so right now I'm on the move one. So I'm gonna hit control shift, I'm gonna scale this down. I'm gonna let go and I'm just gonna move this. Whoops. Uh, gotta make sure I don't grab, there's these little dots, it's hard to see in here. Um, little dots on the corners those dots are basically like scalers so I can scale it around and I want to just move this here and again and I'm just gonna put this up there okay so I kind of roughly place this on top of where that castle would be All right, so I'm gonna hit tab again, and you're gonna see that we don't see that cube inside this scene anywhere, okay? So all that tracker did was it created a camera, and uh, it didn't create it yet. I didn't click that button yet. Um, so on this tracker, I'm gonna go to one more button, create camera, and it creates a camera, okay? So once we have the camera, I'll just hit tab again so we can see it, I'll double click the camera to see it. We actually get a camera inside of our scene. Whee. Um, but it still won't show that cube. All right. So just like Maya, we have to actually build like inside Nuke, we have to build a 3D scene. So I'm going to um, come over here and hit tab and add a scene node. And the scene is basically like what's in the scene. I have a camera, I have a cube, that's all I need right now. So I'm going to say I have a um, camera, so I'll collect, connect the camera to the scene. I have a cube, I'm going to connect the cube to the scene, and then if I view this, I, it takes me into this, it still doesn't get me to see um, that specific item. So in order for me to do this, just like Maya, if we want to see what is inside of our scene, we have to render it out. So I have to render this out. So I'm going to add a ray tray or a scan line renderer. Okay. So in here, if we look, it says, Where's your object or scene? There it is, it's connected. Where's your camera? My camera, it's right here. And then where's your background? And my background is right there. Okay, so now when I view this, what we're going to see is that if I rewind it, there's my cube. Okay, now it comes in completely black because there's no image connected to it. So if I created a constant, if I gave this a color, Sure. And we dropped it onto that. There we go. And then I hit play. What we should see now is my cube is now a 3D cube. And as this camera is panning down or panning up, um, we're seeing this cube actually move in 3D. And because the cube is above the castle in my point view, that I should see this looking or appearing very similar to if it were above that. So it should be moving very similar to uh, being above that specific area. You'll notice there's no shading also on the cube. As a flat constant, it comes in just flat. There's no shading to it. 
So I would have to add the shading. But you can see, let me rewind it. That as this is moving, it definitely looks like that cube is sitting above the castle towers. Okay, so I'm going to add in here um, oops, a fong. So a fong is just a material. Um, I can just drop this in between these. And then what that gives me is it gives me, it should give me a little bit of shading. Oh, I don't have a light in the scene either. So let me add a light into the scene also. Lights. I'll drag that onto the scene, and there we go. So now we actually have some shading in the scene. Now if I switch back to here, you'll see here's my light. So I can move this wherever I need to move it. There's my camera, there's that. Everything's kind of squished at the origin, and that's just like how it always comes in. So if I jump back to my tracker, there it is. I go to my scene, and this is where it's going to set up all my scene settings. And I just make this like 10. There we go. It just automatically scales everything up. Okay? It's not going to move my cube because my cube is a separate object. So I can just move that into position by double clicking my cube and then pulling it over here. And then scaling this up to five, five, ten. There we go. And we'll do that, sure. All right. So now, as we hit play, we're going to see a very similar. I should probably turn everything off so we don't see these dots. Very similar look. Now, with this kind of setup, we can actually create um, mats. We can create masks for all of our stuff. So instead of you having to, let's say, draw out um, these castle towers and animate those rotos moving, I could bring in a model of a castle tower that matches this one, drop it in place, and it'll move exactly the same way the castle tower is. So then I have a mask around it, so if I wanted to put something behind it, I could do that. So you can see this is pretty neat how it's just moving that exact way. <clears throat> uh, I do got a question. Huh? Um, so let's say our initial uh, camera tracking you did, uh, you know, it turned out good when, you know, first time. Uh, let's say if it turned out bad that time, do we just track it again and... Sometimes I'll track it again, sometimes I'll add more points, sometimes I'll take away points. The holy golden cube. <laughs> uh, just like on our other track, sometimes it helps to track just like the red, the green, or the blue channel individually. Um, and a lot of that is just on a shot-by-shot -shot basis. So if I look at the red, the green, or the blue, you know, the blue actually gives me some pretty good contrast. And I'm not getting a whole lot of mess inside the sky. Okay, so that might be an area I, I want to track in there. <clears throat> Another oops, <clears throat> way to uh, adjust that, let me copy this again and just bring it over is let's say that I know I don't want it to track the sky at all. Like, do not track that sky or I'll kill you. Um, I could add a roto, and I could just roto the shape. Oops, I want to make sure I get this. Okay, I can get a little bit of the sky, but it's just it's a just like we talked about, a garbage mat, just for tracking. So I can say track this, and then I'm going to go up a bit, and then just adjust what I'm tracking. Okay, and it automatically sets keys. So I'm basically just saying just track locking up on me come on there we go that and then this and let me go back in between that's pretty good there we go and then I'll pre multiply this just so it's just that and then I would add my camera tracker to this and then what this is going to do, if I go to my tracker, and I go to my settings, and I preview my tracks, you'll see it's just on these. Okay? And the fact that it's on those, I don't know why it's doing that, it shouldn't be. Yeah. Mm. 
the weird black blob thing. I'm not sure what it is. Hmm. Yeah, it's weird. It shouldn't be tracking the edge of that. Refund. Da -da -da, da -da. All right, well, look into that, why it's doing that. Um, the other thing we do is play with these detection threshold. Um, the neat thing about all of these, you hold your mouse over it, and it'll say, using a lower threshold to spread out, produce can, accurate, can give you a, a more accurate result. So instead of 0 0.1, 0 0.05, it's going to go slower, more accurate result. Adding more tracks, um, it's weird. It could help it or it could hurt it. Okay, it really depends on the specific shot. So you typically I'll try more, like 300. Now I'll get 300 more of these. Um, feature separation. So this is kind of like the box. So we had the tiny box in the middle, and then we had that bigger box. So this is like the bigger box, like how far apart do you want these things? You obviously wouldn't want to track like, you see how close these two are. Um, I would want this one here, and then this one here, and then this one here, and then that one there. That might be like too many tracks together. So I could separate the features by more points, and it'll push them away. So all of these things will help. The other thing we can do is, let me delete this junk here, and go back to this tracker, is once we've tracked our stuff, and I've hit this solve camera, I can actually go to my auto tracks and I could start to play with some of my settings. Why aren't I seeing anything? Here we go. Um, I could say that I want my maximum track error to be um, one. And my minimum length, like how long is it tracking something, to be uh, pros to be 12 frames. So what this is doing is it's isolating certain features. It's basically saying, I don't want tracks that are gonna be on for at least 12 frames, and if there's a tracking error above one, just eliminate that point totally. And sometimes those will give you better tracks. Um, and sometimes in very rare cases, it literally is like a frame by frame tracking process. Just how it is. Um, and then I would say refine, there you go, delete rejected. Are you sure? No, <laughs> I'm never sure. Um, I'm going to duplicate this first. And then on this one, I will delete all those extras. 12, 1, delete rejected. Yes. So if we look at that one, you can see it got rid of a lot of those points. Or did it? Um, I can also also come in here, and there's a bar. Where's that bar at? Uh, error track. No, max error. That's what I want. Oh. No, I'm on the right one. Number three. Number three. Um. Come on. Now, typically, I'm able to move these, probably because I already created it, doesn't want to let me. Um, but this is showing me how many points are being tracked throughout. So here's my average track length is over 100 frames. So my 12, saying it's going to be 12 is not like a huge deal, like 100 is where it's at. My minimum is pretty low though. Okay, so you can eliminate stuff this way too. Oh, there it goes. So as I take this to, that's my error max say three and I delete the rejected yes you see how it eliminated all those tracks right there so anything above three just said nope I'm not gonna even consider those points all right so more stuff we could play with it uh, further down um, all the programs that you deal with like Buju and PF track they all have that same thing so we can play with it um, if you were to go in After Effects and you did a camera track in After Effects you get a two and a half D rep, uh, representation of it. You don't get an actual like 3D camera. You don't get any of this feature stuff that you can edit. It's basically like, well, I guess that worked. There you go. Or it didn't work. Um, yeah, and then here's where we can punch in some lens distortion on the lens if we need to or whatever. All right. 
Now we could also take this. Let me go and delete this one. Get rid of that one. Right here. Um, I could also take this and um, add in what's called the model builder, and the model builder allows me to basically build geometry. So it wants to know some information. It says, okay, um, here's some geometry. If we had any, here's some textures. And then where's your camera? Just wants to know where the camera is. That's all we have to hook up to this. Some of these they may have like several nodes, but you really only have to hook up a couple of them. So in the model builder, it takes me into this kind of weird view. Oops, I can't close that, I need it open. There we go. Okay, Am I, I'm in 3D, but I'm basically like locked into this 3D mode. And as I move, it's updating this. So I'm basically like looking through my camera. That's what I'm doing. Uh, if I come over here, <clears throat> this is where I can create stuff. So watch how I can create a card right here. So it says add card in progress. I'm going to cover up this clock. So I'm going to click and drag and I <coughs> fix that clock right there. Perfect. So I fixed the clock and then I'm going to go up a little bit to like, let's say 100. I'm going to move this back down to where the clock is. And just by setting a couple keyframes on here, I should have grabbed this middle one. Right, let, me, let me delete that one and redo it. So I'm going to grab that again. I'm going to click and drag from the center. There we go. It covers up that and it's hitting the corners. Perfect. I'm going to go to 100. I'm going to grab the middle. Drag it back to the center. Everything's lined up still. Go to 150. Pull that down to the center again. All right, so just me kind of realigning that several times locks it into Nuke to say that's where that should be. Maybe I'll pull it up a little bit more here at the end. And then I'll go to the very end and just verify that it's still there if it's even on screen. And I can adjust it here too. There we go. Cool. All right. So now that piece of footage, that card is now locked into that spot, so that as the camera's moving, I can replace that card with whatever I want. If I want to eliminate that clock, I can grab a patch of the building and I could cut it off, and I could just drop it right on top of it, and it'll replace that piece of it. I could actually bring in this first image into Photoshop fix that, bring that one piece in, drop it on there, and everything will be cool. So you see how it's just tracking perfectly, it's just right on top of it. And just to see how that works, uh, I'm going to take the card and I'm going to say, make this a piece of geometry. Bake it. There we go. So now I have a piece of geometry that I could then use into my scene. And then on the image part, I'll do color bars. So why wouldn't you have color bars on your castle wall? Now I'll look through my renderer. There we go. And now you can see I have these color bars that line up perfectly with where that clock used to be. Okay, so what I want you to do is once you're done with that past assignment, the iPad one, is I want you just to bring in the footage and just start playing with the camera tracker, start playing with the model builder, and start getting to this point. Um, Inside of here, oops, I'm still inside this camera. Let me switch this back to the default. Um, inside here, come on, you're killing me. <laughs> uh, we're not locked. I'm going to go to my preferences, and inside of this, one of these buttons here, viewer, browser, controller, appearance, position. Should be the viewer, you know? No. <laughs> Whatever. Um, so inside of here, this camera is really probably lined up to where the ground is. So it's kind of like, it doesn't know what the ground is, so it's like this, okay? So should we rotate it so that it is lined up with the ground? When we were doing stuff like that, it doesn't really matter, okay? Uh, when we actually were using 3D geometry or taking this into Maya, we definitely do. It can just be tricky to do it because the only spot to do that in 
um, obviously we could like go to our camera and rotate our camera around but then it doesn't rotate the scene is that would rotate this camera tracker there we go. and under the scene node we would have to come down here to our rotation and just keep playing with this until we're lined up okay now it could be if it's as simple as that sure it works great but usually it's not usually we have to rotate it this way then rotate it that way then rotate it some other crazy way to get it lined up so um, I just ruined everything now thank you <laughs> all right so um, so that's what I want you to do just take this scene and just start playing with it play with the model builder um, play with the um, other part this that whole thing can be used for like a whole bunch of stuff like even downloads tracking plates So like for this license one, um, we could track the car and have the car be a tracking point and then put the license plate there. Maybe that might work. Um, we've used it before on this piece. So you see this lady walking up and so what we do is we eliminate the lady in the shot. We track the footage and then we can actually like redraw this U-Haul. We can replace it with whatever we want. 